And tonight we're joined by PR consultant Alex Dean and director of Demos think tank Polly McKenzie. Hello, uh, Hello to you both. So we're going to start uh, with Airbus, the front of the Financial Times. Uh, Airbus warning, if there's a no-deal Brexit, well, they're out. People with um, good memories in the UK will remember this is the same business that said they would leave if we didn't join the Euro. And thank goodness we didn't join the Euro and Airbus is still here. Then, of course, before we had the referendum, they said they would strongly consider leaving were we to be so foolish as to vote to determine our own national future and vote to leave the EU. And we did so, and they're still here. So um, one takes these declarations with a certain pinch of salt. We don't, not, not we're frib frivolous about it. It's 14,000 jobs, and it's very significant uh, for those people they're, who they're work in They're talking about a billion euro a week hit on the business. Well, you can claim, of course, uh, numbers that you can build the worst case around and round up. But, of course, this is a business that's just been uh, ruled by the WTO to have received some 22 billion uh, US dollars improperly from the EU. So they have, um, let's say, a particular position on these questions that I think is not entirely unbiased. They're not alone, though, Polly, are they, in calling for clarity from no, the so Street? No, BMW, were a German company, uh, were swift to follow Airbus, actually, to, to say, kind of, I guess, just wave a flag of warning. The government is still pushing for what, in my mind, is a completely ridiculous settlement, which will lead to more friction at our border than we need. And if you think about what Airbus do, putting together these incredibly complex aeroplane sure. wings, there are parts that travel across borders five or six times before they make it into the aeroplane wing. And if you have to be stopped at checked, even if it's just for a couple of minutes at a time, that really threatens the entirety of the just-in-time model of advanced manufacturing. And I think it's entirely right for businesses who are concerned about that to speak out. The government, in the end, will make a decision uh, on behalf of our democracy. But I personally think that they should make a decision that keeps us in the customs union, keeps us in the single market and retains... Well, that's the same as not leaving the EU, really. Well, but... it's not, because you, once you come out of the institutions of the European Union, there's all sorts of flexibilities that you have, including reforming the common agricultural policy and our agricultural subsidies, different approaches to public procurement, yeah. different... There's plenty the, that the you can do. The things you're urging us to do would stymie our ability to do trade deals with others, because it would require us to have uniformity of tariffs with third countries, like America, yeah. China, India, high-growth places, rather than the lowest growth because area. I don't world, want us to spend 25 years clawing our way back to the position that we've established over the last 40 years of an integrated economy with the European Union not... and be supplicant, oh, supplicant to Donald Trump, who's trying Polly, to start a trade we war. We don't have an integrated economy with the EU. There's still no single market in services, which... You're absolutely I, what right. Is it's, a shame, it's a shame we won't be there to make the case for extending the single market to services anymore. We've made a democratic decision to leave, in my, and in my view, rightly. But, look, I don't dismiss the... the um, uh, the point you make about businesses calling for clarity, that's entirely legitimate. And I, I dare say many businesses would like to know more about what's happening in, in these negotiations. I mean, put aside to the fact that most EU deals tend to happen in the last minute, at the 11th hour. But, but, but that's different from crying wolf and saying, I'm going to leave if you don't do what I want, which is what Airbus is now doing again, third time. Is it scaremongering? Is this more project fear, Polly? I think, I think they're doing exactly the right thing, making the case for... Uh, frictionless trade across our borders just at the time when you the government know. is making its you, final decision. Do you which think is this is more likely to get their way because of what they've done today? I'm not sure it will, but no. I think it's important for them to make the case. It's important for them to tell, and as with BMW, to make the case for the integrated, high-value manufacturing that this country is brilliant at and to sure. protect our and, automotive and, and continue to be brilliant aer at aeronautic in, industries. Including the very large supply chain that exists for well, Airbus 100, here. 100,000 jobs. 110,000, and they're here. So they're going to, they can't reconstruct that in a year um, elsewhere. So I, I rather think people need to look very carefully at what Airbus no, is saying uh, and question their motives. Uh, well, in its, I, I think the idea of a sort of sudden pullout overnight from any of these businesses is pretty unlikely. What's much more likely is a slow drop Drip, drip. We already see the UK economy lagging behind the rest Our of... Our economy has grown every month since we voted to leave the EU. Every single month. Yes, but it's not growing as quickly as uh, counterpart countries across Europe. And I... Like what, like Italy or Spain, Greece? Which... which... Um, it's lagging behind the EU average 
quite dramatically. No, not dramatically. And of course, because we're not in a um, currency union, we don't face the, in the inability to control our own economy. Uh, when did we enter the currency union? Yeah. I, I agree. It's a tremendous thing that we didn't join the euro. I don't think I was ever in favour of well, that. I'm going to move us on, if that's Excellent. all right, because um, let's go to the Times and we're going to stay with trade. But this is uh, a trade war potentially looming with Donald Trump's threat today of 20 percent tariffs on European cars. Yeah, so, th I mean, this is how trade wars really escalate, isn't it? It started with Donald Trump invoking national security to put tariffs on steel and aluminium, or aluminum, as he might call it. Um, the EU has retaliated by putting what they described as tariffs on classic American goods, though, of course, you can't just target Harley-Davidson's and uh, particular Jeans. and Kentucky bourbon, but they've singled out oranges and bourbon eye, eye catching things eye catching things to tell a to tell a story that they're they're putting tariffs on and trump has responded by saying he wants to put um tariffs on european cars of 20 percent uh, the european car manufacturers shares have taken a hit as a result of that threat which classically for trump yeah. was issued on twitter uh, and we, we talked about threats and whether or not sure. they're serious about it in the last story is trump serious here do you think Alex? i think he probably is yeah. and look trade wars are bad and consumers lose but of course we are currently in a protectionist customs union these conversations are related the yeah. eu has a tariff on cars people say we've got this fantastic um economy that shares things within the eu but of course it makes it more expensive to bring things that would otherwise be better and cheaper for consumers from outside the eu and the president's country under Obama, under Bush, not a party political point, has faced these tariffs from uh, the EU for some time. And one could make the case, I mean, I'm a free marketeer and I think tariffs are bad, but what one could make the case that Trump's actions are overdue, given that the EU has imposed tariffs like this itself for so long. Um, let's go to the front of the Times uh, now, and uh, police paedophile scandal is the headline there. What's the story about? It's an extraordinary story. You think about what we've um, seen with the Rotherham grooming and accusations that the police hadn't uh, taken seriously, accusations that uh, girls were being systematically groomed. Then consider the stories that we've heard about police officers who are undercover, um, forming long-term relationships with people, getting them pregnant, uh, and, and so forth uh, wrongly. Now it, it's, it's said that senior police officers allowed a 13-year-old boy to spend nearly two hours in the home of a known paedophile and gangster in order to protect an operation that they were mounting. Uh, and those who conducted that, that operation saw the boy enter the home curtains closed, windows closed, you've got to wonder what kind of moral responsibility mm -hmm. uh, the police have to a minor in that situation. And in the end, and I, I, I don't, again, not, not being frivolous or flippant, because I appreciate they're investigating serious things, but what comes first? It seems to me it can't be you know, allowing them to carry on their business. Yeah, as Alex says, I mean, this is a, it's a concerning story and it's part of a pattern. Um, I think we really need to think about the whole structure of our police force is actually having this sort of disaggregated 43 police force structure actually makes it really hard to have areas of expertise, of training when it comes yeah. to more difficult, complicated cases like this. Actually, if we could have a, a much more local structure for the really local crimes, um, burglary and robbery and uh, antisocial behaviour, and actually have, have police that are able to specialise yeah, more. That's, that's interesting, but of course they, the trouble is, maybe you're right on the structure, they, currently, whenever something comes out, you know, t the police lied when uh, they said the Liverpool fans caused the crush at Hillsborough, for, for, example, for example, people say, well, we had the investigation, it was a one-off. You know, the yeah. child grooming, OK, we had the investigation, it was a one-off. The answer to this will be, we had the investigation, it was a one-off. And there's no learning from, um, from anything that happens. And if, if you did that in business, you'd be for the high jump. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, we now have police and crime commissioners mm. who, in theory at least, ought to be held accountable for the kind of uh, judgments like this that, that police officers have if made. They are, if they we... sign off on them, though, I mean, you, if, if it's an operational decision that they never had any sight of, it's difficult, I think, for... I think, I think PCCs are great, but I think it's difficult for them to take account, uh, to take responsibility for something they had no sight of, right? Th that's right, but they ought to be responsible for setting the strategic approach of their police I force. I completely and, agree. And things like the ethical and moral boundaries and judgments that you might make. In Absolutely right. Situation. This sort of thing should never happen again. No. It shouldn't have happened in the first place. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go to uh, the Express now, and uh, Sajid Javid, uh, I 
softer line on immigration, but a large majority of voters backing Theresa May's tough stance, according to the Express. It, it goes to show, so it's, it, it was off the back of some polling. Um, Channel 4 polled uh, voters about whether they favoured strong controls on immigration, and specifically the phrase that Theresa May uh, has been held responsible for, do you favour a hostile environment? And even after all of the, th the things that we've had said, and people, the Windrush generation, uh, wrongly, uh, uh, supposedly wrongly deported, or some of them actually, it turns out, weren't wrongly deported, and so forth, um, a majority of the public still favour strong immigration controls. And I actually don't think this is particularly surprising. I think that in, in an, um, addition to arguments about sovereignty and um, control of our own money, control of our own borders is a reasonable thing to have wanted to leave the European Union over. And you can't, as long as in the EU, meaningfully control your borders. So I think it's up to us as a country, as this survey reflects, um, to decide who comes to our country and the manner in which they come. And if we've occasionally got it very wrong, uh, as you've been covering with the, the Windrush Generation stories today, then we should apologise for it and, if necessary, uh, compensate people. But that still doesn't mean that we should be uh, soft on immigration. I think this um, survey shows that. And I also think that actually <laughs> having a hostile environment for illegal immigration is right, in the same way that the police should be hostile to burglars. But are we seeing here, Polly, uh, the difference between policy on paper and what it means practically? <coughs> because more than half of people, half of those surveys still support the hostile environment policy. And yet, then yet, when you look at the reaction <coughs> to the Windrush <coughs> generation... <coughs> I'll let you take a drink, uh, Polly. So, Alex, yeah. I might say this. <laughs> and look to the US. What Polly would have said. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Looking to the US, for example, yeah. with Donald Trump and his tough stance on immigration and yet <coughs> the reaction to the sure. images we've had. Of course, the week. Obama administration. Um, treated uh, people, treated people very similarly, not, not the same, but had um, similarly robust controls on migration. And I think Hillary Clinton said in the course of the campaign uh, against uh, President Trump that she uh, believed that just getting into the country doesn't mean that you've got a right to stay. Uh, and I thought that that was uh, telling that this isn't actually a party <coughs> political point particularly. So it's neither a party political point, nor is it a particularly uh, unique to the UK or the US. But my point is on this. Um, Sajid Javid may well wish to, uh, host, uh, to demonstrate we are a more welcoming country than a hostile environment for illegal immigration might suggest. The distinction being, hostile environment for illegal immigration is good. Welcoming people who come here lawfully and come to work, tremendous. And we can get that balance right. And Greg Clark, the Business Secretary, calling for measures to ensure the free movement of people across the EU. Um, Polly, I don't know if you're... Uh... How are you doing? Back and able to, to talk. <laughs> no, I'm fine. I'm uh, right, shall we talk you. about um, A level maths questions up for sale on the internet and this in the Times? Yeah, this is really concerning. Um, some maths questions uh, for, for an A level exam put up for sale on the internet. And the, the real challenge here is that, of course, once a, a set of questions are compromised, the, the children, the teenagers, have to take a different set of exams. Um, and that can delay the whole process, delay yeah. university applications, could actually jeopardise the whole. A whole summer for a whole load of teenagers That's because of somebody's huge really stress they're already unacceptable behaviour. Imagine how unfair it is that your position at university might potentially be put in... I mean, I'm sure universities will be reasonable about it. <laughs> how, how unjust is it that the university, the exam board that you happen to have is yeah. X rather than Y, mm. and therefore your exams yeah. might get pushed back? These poor kids need certainty. And I tell you what, whoever has put these questions up for sale really should have the sky falling on them. Yeah. Um, let's have a quick look at the Express. Calls for a Brexit Independence Day, a bank holiday. What a great idea. I, I knew you'd like this What a great one. idea. Funnily Look, enough, What Alex. is the point of having two in May when we could instead get rid of May Day because we're oh, not so a country of lefties? Any... Well, you could be an extra one, but I think given productivity questions we face as a country, we should scrap the meaningless celebration of May Day for lefties and we should instead... I know people are going to say that's not what May Day is. Um, and instead, we should have a, a Brexit Independence Day, marking our independence much as the Americans mark their ill-fated experiment, the results of which are still playing out um uh i would much rather have a new bank holiday for st george's day oh celebrate englishness you, you out english me. very good <laughs> well done um on to uh the times back to the times uh, now a pollen bomb yeah, that's what I'm suffering from. Yes, it no, is. I, this little pollen, did, Polly little would have did pollen we know bomb. when we chose this story that Polly would be vividly oh, demonstrating. Matt, absolutely. Yeah, this is uh, actually it's page four of the Times. If we uh, can bring that one up onto the screen, we might not have Point it. Being, weather's going to be great, but the pollen count is going to go through for, the roof. For poor asthmatics like me, with plane trees all down my street, just this, 
I feel like, um, you know, in Stranger Things, with that sort of white floaty stuff in the air, I feel like that's where I am. I'm inhaling some sort Suffocated of toxic thing. Um, anyway, so I apologise to all of your viewers, but it's the pollen's fault that did it. And pollen, not pollen. carried on uh, remarkably. Polly, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Polly and Alex, we'll see you in the next hour for more uh, on the papers.